We've talked about discontinuous lurking for a while now, but we haven't really seen any simulation examples. So that's kind of what I want to do in this video. So I'm asking you to, to code a discontinuous lurking method in one of the assignments and you'll get to see some results in that sense. But of course, that's a relatively uh, simple problem. It's, it's one dimensional. Uh, so I, I want to show some more advanced um, simulations and kind of show you what discontinuous lurking methods are, are capable of. So pretty much all the, the simulations that I'm going to show you here in these couple of slides are, are from this book here. This is the Encyclopedia of Computational Mechanics, and specifically the addition of fluids. Uh, so this is a series of uh, three or, or four books um, that have been updated once or twice. Um, that ranges a whole, a whole set of topics in, in computational mechanics, and there's a big chapter on discontinuous Gluckian methods in this one. And so I think in general this is a... It's a good reference to have. Um, I wouldn't advise anyone to, to try and read the whole book, but uh, it's, a, it's a good reference to, to look up uh, if, you're, if you get stuck or if you're interested in a particular topic. So the first simulation example that we, we can look at is really kind of the staple example for discontinuous lurking method. We've seen that DG methods um, originate from the need to, to treat hyperbolic partial differential equations now, our one-dimensional advection equation is an example of that, uh, but clearly the intent is to solve more challenging problems. And a, a very obvious example of a very challenging hyperbolic uh, equation is the Euler equations of gas dynamics. Uh, so these are the equations of compressible flow in the limit of zero diffusion. And so we typically use these equations to treat extremely high velocity airflow or extremely uh, thin uh, density airflow, uh, so uh, upper atmosphere. Um, but similar examples originate uh, from um, uh, shallow water uh, waves. So I don't know if I should say similar, but uh, also nonlinear hyperbolic equations. Uh, so this is a, a typical benchmark uh, simulation of um, fluid flow in general, and specifically the Euler equations. We have this backwards facing step. So we have fluid coming in from the left, uh, moving to the right, uh, and it's obstructed by this step uh, at the bottom. And well, the, the, characteristic, the characteristic physics of the Euler equation, and in general, a high uh, velocity of airflow, is that you get these uh, steep layers. Um, and in the Euler equations, you would get shocks. Yeah? So these are actual uh, shocks. There's a jump in the pressure field. And so I believe. And a jump in the density as well. So I think these are density uh, iso contours. And that's going to be a problem that is extremely difficult to solve with a continuous Gluckian method. And I don't even know if that's uh, possible. I, I haven't uh, seen any simulations that do that. So that's why a finite volume method would still um, be applicable for a case like this. Or, as we've seen now, also discontinuous Gluckian methods. Yeah? So this is precisely uh, what the discontinuous Gluckian method uh, promises to bring to a finite element context uh, on top of uh, what a continuous Gluckian method can do. Yeah, so we see here these, these different shocks, uh, and we kind of know how these shocks should behave, so we have uh, an idea of what the physics should be, and that's uh, also <coughs> carried over to this numerical example here. So the top and bottom differences is a difference in polynomial order. Now, that's one of the beauties of the discontinuous Gluckian method that we are extremely flexible in, in terms of uh, polynomial refinement uh, because our, all our basis functions just live on the element interior so we can locally uh, change the polynomial order uh, very flexibly. And in this case I, I think we, we mostly see um, some, some more detail in, in fine uh, behavior here. And um, I guess I point out these, these little vertical structures right here. Yeah? So that there's more detail in there. But um, in general, I would say that even the P1 case already uh, characterizes most of the important behavior uh, being these shocks here. Another example of kind of the same, the same idea here is that if you have certain uh, uh, shock waves that, that, that hit each other, that's a, a notoriously difficult problem to treat. Um, you have certain rules of thumb of how these shock waves then reflect and deflect. Um, but in complex cases, of course, those rules of thumb don't really uh, uh, cut it. So you would need a, a numerical uh, simulation technique. And we see here that, that that's precisely what the discontinuous Gluckian method can do. 
And I, I think uh, to really appreciate simulation results like these, uh, you kind of have to understand that this is extremely, extremely difficult to, to compute um, with, with other methods. And, and I suppose, again, finite volume methods will be able to, to do this, specialized finite volume methods, uh, but uh, standard uh, Galerkin methods would really struggle. And these are simulation results that are already 20 years old, right? So you can see that this is from 1998. So actually, uh, Oh, sorry, this should be Coburn and Chu. Um, Bernardo Coburn is also the person that wrote the chapter uh, on DG on this book. In this book. So then, uh, moving away a little bit from Euler equations, because maybe high uh, high velocity fluid flow is not something that we see a lot in, in civil engineering. Uh, but something like this, uh, an explosion, uh, is relevant also to civil engineers. Um, a bit of a trend in, in building design is is um, is uh, a safety in the sense of uh, explosion uh, resistance. Um, of course, demolition of buildings and bridges also involves explosions, right? So that's something that we uh, we do observe in our in our field. And again, explosions because of their high velocities are are very far in the hyperbolic uh, limit of the equations, um, and DG methods can treat these. And I think that one of the key things to observe here as well is the meshes that are used for a problem like this. And that's a major strength of the discontinuous Glurkin method. That again, because these basis functions are so uh, independent of one another, we can do all kinds of crazy tricks in terms of refinement that in a continuous Glurkin method would, would be very, very difficult to do, if not impossible. And I think that the picture that you're seeing here is not even a prime example of that. And that would be this uh, simulation where we have, I, I believe, just the obvious Stokes equations for a rotor blade. Um, and you see uh, the mesh on the right is, is really what I want to emphasize in, in this slide here, um, where you see that these elements are, are simply dissected uh, and they can do this adaptively. So they can take, they can, can take a solution field, uh, they would have some error measure in terms of maybe a residual or in terms of uh, where, where sharp layers occur. Uh, and then they would refine those elements. And because elements are completely detached from one another, uh, the basis functions at least, uh, you can locally refine, you can locally subdivide an element without any issue. I mean, your code has to be able to handle this, uh, but there's no conceptual problem with this. And the same thing does not hold for a continuous Glurkin method. Uh, you would not be able to simply subdivide a continuous Glurkin method element, so a standard finite element method element, uh, because yeah, you have these continuity constraints. Your, your basis functions somehow need to match up from element to element. The G method, they don't, and we can do uh, stuff like this. Yeah? So, so that's kind of the promise of this continuous Galerkin method. Um, now, I should uh, kind of address the elephant in the room as well, though. Um, there's going to be a huge cost increase if you change from a continuous Galerkin method to a discontinuous Galerkin method on the same mesh. And you can already see this in a 1D case. Um, if I only have two elements, and maybe I even have... Uh, um, Dirichlet constraints on both sides, well, then my continuous Glurkin method would have a single degree of freedom, right? That's a node in the, the interior. And if I have a discontinuous Glurkin method, uh, and suppose I still have constraints on, on the, uh, the, the main boundaries, uh, then I suddenly have two degrees of freedom because, well, on either side of the element, I have a degree of freedom. So that's already a factor of two, and that would maintain also for a larger one dimensional mesh. And in multi dimensions, that, that's also going to cross over. So you would get a factor of four difference in 2D and a factor of eight difference in, in 3D, roughly. Uh, you can work this out more explicitly uh, um, for sp specific choices of meshes, but that's uh, a rough example of what that would, what that level of, uh, of cost increase would be. Um, now that's gonna also depend on the polynomial order in a positive sense, actually. So for higher polynomial orders, uh, the increase in cost is less but it's still significant. Um, so to justify the use of a discontinuous Galerkin method, you really have to deal with the problem where that cost increase is outweighed by the benefits. And the benefits can be twofold. Uh, they can be uh, the robust treatment of hyperbolic problems, um, and they can be uh, because of uh, a mesh refinement uh, flexibility like what we're seeing right here. So that cost problem is, is actually very significant, I really want to emphasize that. Um, and there's been quite a lot of research in terms of uh, trying to mitigate that. And 
there's been significant uh, improvement. Um, there are techniques where we can we can try and subdivide our computation in one computation where we're only computing the element boundary values of a discontinuous Galerkin approximation. And then the second step that can be perfectly parallelized where we go over each element to solve the interior. Um, but I, I believe that still um, in the best case scenario, it's not going to beat a continuous Galerkin method in terms of uh, computational expense. Um, so also in the best case scenario, um, we would really only use a discontinuous Galerkin method uh, for cases where uh, we, we typically would not be able to use a continuous Galerkin method. Um, and I think I only really have one more slide, and that kind of relates to the slide that we're seeing right here. Uh, I was saying this is a Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, Navier-Stokes equation is, is not a purely hyperbolic conservation law, uh, as we've seen. Um, I motivated that uh, the compressible Navier-Stokes equation has an elliptic part, and then it has a part that either tends toward a parabolic or a hyperbolic uh, equation depending on the Reynolds number, depending on the, the amount of uh, advection versus diffusion. Yeah, that's essentially what the Reynolds number is. Um, so, in order to treat a compressible, or sorry, an incompressible Navier Stokes equation, and actually also a compressible Navier Stokes equation, we have to be able to handle a diffusion term. And that's a, a non hyperbolic term, that's an elliptic term. So, it's almost the exact opposite of a hyperbolic term. So we've talked quite extensively about hyperbolic uh, terms, right? We talked about different flux formulations. We derived the equations uh, for a hyperbolic conservation law. Uh, but it's also very important that we're able to also treat this diffusion term. And that's kind of the last uh, rather straightforward example that I have here, right? So how about a simple diffusion problem? For a continuous Galerkin method, we get a continuous solution. So we also want to be able to treat problems like these with a discontinuous Galerkin method. And we don't want to do this because we necessarily want to be able to solve diffusion-based problems with the discontinuous Galerkin method, because for these problems, continuous Galerkin methods perform extremely well, uh, and they're much cheaper. But still, uh, we want to be able to treat problems for which the continuous Galerkin method um, has issues, such as extreme high Reynolds number flow, um, which do still involve a diffusion term. Uh, so in those cases, we might want to use a discontinuous Galerkin method because of the robustness. Uh, but in order to use a discontinuous Galerkin method, we need to be able to treat this diffusion term. Yeah, so that's actually going to be uh, what we'll discuss in the, the subsequent two videos and uh, also actually last two videos on the topic on discontinuous Galerkin method. Yeah, so I'll get actually right into making those videos. Uh, but I hope that with these uh, couple of slides, I kind of give you a visual interpretation of of what discontinuous Galerkin methods are about and what they can do. And, uh, but I also hope that I emphasized uh, the limits and specifically the extreme computational expense. Now, thank you for your attention and see you in the next video.